Now, I'm sorry that you don't have uh, Tony Hollis to, to speak to you. Um, uh, because you can bring a lot of insight uh, to this topic. But what we're going to look at first is outreaching culture in a church. And from where we're sitting at 10 past 9, um, I'll attempt to go for just about half an hour. And uh, then we'll break it. I think we'll go in small groups first to discuss and then any feedback that we're able to manage it. Um, my own background in terms of this topic, um, I've just grabbed some notes, by the way, out of some other things that Tony and I have done together. And uh, did a five minute preparation during breakfast. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, so we have spoken on this before. I went straight from school at age 18 to BCNZ, now called Labour College, and did a Bachelor of Ministries there. Uh, and then went into eight years of outreach ministry. Um, uh, one with uh, Youth for Christ, and then spent seven years in Harvard. I'm ministering with Stu Miller over here. So uh, we've been friends since kindergarten at three years of age. Um, and uh, Craig, uh, as well as his older brother, but I never really knew Craig because he was a big boy, you know, uh, at that stage. Um, but my parents even bought um, Stu and Craig's parents' previous house when they moved elsewhere. And Stu's still bitter at me for a truck that he thinks he lost in the sandbook, which he's convinced that I, um, <laughs> I have. <laughs> so, yeah. so now we're giving it back. <laughs> but, but I would say that our focus was outreach, but in those first years, running a youth ministry, uh, doing multiple things in schools, really I was just running on adrenaline. And, and I think that this is what ministry starts like for a lot of us. We, we don't have a lot of strategy within our thinking. Uh, we're just trying to change the world. And we've got all our ideas that we've had before we've started a ministry, and we just you know, we, we, we blurt them all out. Uh, but then five years in, we realise that it's not quite as simple as all of that, and things don't quite change like that. And, um, evangelism training, just to note, it was very hard to find. I don't remember anyone teaching me how to share the gospel until the times of OJ, and, and then being shown um, you know, a, a reasonably um, uh, direct way of sharing the gospel. Um, until then, we were just making it up as we went, and by God's grace, uh, God still worked, and, and a few people you know, came to the Lord through all of that. Uh, I became a pastor in Singapore after that, and uh, so, so now the shoes were on the other feet. Uh, you know, I wasn't just the person doing the evangelism and discipling young people. Now I was responsible in, in a different way. And within two years, I was pretty frustrated at the lack of focus on the gospel uh, that was within the congregation. So I was in charge of the youth young adult, which had basically died in the church I went to. And then I was one of the, um, the main Sunday preachers and, and service leading, and then ended up in charge of the adult cells as well. So about 40 adult cell groups. And... Um, then I realized, I looked in the mirror and thought, maybe I'm the problem. My concept of evangelism training is that we're supposed to run a seminar and we invite, invite everyone to the seminar, but the hard-hearted members don't turn up to these seminars. What's wrong with them? Um, wait a minute, it's the mission of the church. If it's the mission of the church, that's, that's something reasonably important, isn't it? Uh, should we maybe talk about that from the pulpit? And so it was then that my thinking changed and I thought, oh, I'm not going to do evangelism seminars again unless we're trying to encourage culture and turning churches around starting from the pulpit. So I took that to evangelism training, I turned it into sermons with, with matching small group studies and thus went the first year. And uh, within the first year, of course, everybody knew how to uh, basically start engaging a conversation, share the gospel and share their story. So what do you preach about the second year? Uh -huh, uh -huh. And now things can really begin to change because the, the breadth of content that you're giving is no longer limited to a three-hour Saturday seminar attended by the already convinced. Uh, it, it's now every single person, you know, close the doors, lock them, they can't escape on Sunday morning. Um, and, and everybody can be equipped, reinforced through the small group. And, and so my learning of the leadership levels uh, involved in changing culture just kept on growing from there. Um, the application of the youth young adult was easy by contrast to the adult, and we ended up with some leadership challenges that really uh, inhibited the ability to, to apply these principles that, that I ended up applying really in a healthy way at the adult uh, congregation level. Uh, the youth started with 35, within five years we were crossing um, 300 uh, youth and young adults. Uh, we ended up with 23 um, cell groups uh, in that sort of division, sort of uh, between the ages of uh, 12 and uh, 22 years of age, the people within them. And I worked out that even 14-year-olds, because I was experimenting with how young can a leader be. I believe in young people. I believe in the potential that is within young people. So you've got a whole gamut here of philosophy about uh, small group leadership. How young can they actually get as a leader? And I found that the most exceptional leaders could do it at age 14. 
And they can lead a small group, build an outreaching culture while encouraging the devotional reading, you know, the love for God and the care for one another. They could lead a healthy group and they could see it grow and could see it multiply. Uh, however, others, um, their cognitive development for leadership didn't kick in until about age 20, just to note it. So people develop up here differently. So I found that other young people were really useless as leaders and had no uh, uh, natural ability whatsoever until they reached 19 or 20 years of age. And then something up here changed and suddenly the intuitions began to, to kick in. So in any case, what I'm uh, about to show you is what came out of that, because returning to New Zealand <coughs> with, a, with a strong sense of call to come to New Zealand on a mission. So I wasn't coming back to come home, I was coming here on a mission to really just take on evangelism a, a, as a whole gamot. Uh, how could this be made simple? How could this be made transferable? That's what I was, was thinking through. Uh, I'd already worked with a, a range of um, uh, other youth and young adult pastors in Singapore, uh, sometimes who would inherit in, in the larger churches, youth ministries of one, two, three, four hundred. I mean, our youth ministry alone ran three worship teams. If you can you know, just imagine the dynamics that are in play. We had multiple ministries. Um, you know, um, I, I was overseeing a major event every three weeks with, within my ministry work. Um, so many youth ministries are larger than New Zealand churches, and people are put in charge of them who have no theological or strategic training. So I had an opportunity to experiment on, on lots of people, which was, was really good. Uh, and so, so, so what I'm about to show you is the simplification. If we took it down to the most simple principles and the most simple habits that we would embrace, what might that look like? So um, here's the download that some of you would have seen. Um, just a couple of other thoughts that I scribbled in those five minutes, which because I've had no preparation time, I forgot I'd put here. Um, the main person through the main platform has to make the main thing within the main thing. Um, so this is, this is, I think, quite an important statement. I've already covered some of it. The main person, the church leader, through the main platform, uh, that's the pulpit, has to make the main thing within the main thing. What is that? The main thing is the mission of the church. But I put to you also that the main thing within the main thing is the mobilization of the individual uh, to uh, the work of the gospel. You know, Ephesians 4, the principle is that, that the, the leadership gifts are given to equip and mobilize the people for the work of the ministry. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. We're not the priests. The members are the priests. We're nothing other than the Bible school trainers through our Sunday services uh, for the everyday ministry. And a hundred mobilized members can achieve far more than a talented pastor. Exactly. So, so there's a mind shift here in that we are discipled through our experience in a very program-centric way of doing church. And if you want to increase your outreach capacity, then you run Alpha. And by all means, run Alpha. But uh, you, get, you, know, you get all these different ministries that you add onto your church. And, and these are like the toppings of the pizza. Pizza toppings are programs. But the base of the pizza is the culture. If the culture isn't authentically evangelistic, it doesn't have a sincere heart for the lost and the skill and ability to engage conversationally within the culture, then all you've got is alpha uh, with 10% of the church who really get it supporting, becoming increasingly frustrated at why the other 90% don't seem to care. You know what I mean? Because the culture of the church isn't authentically outreaching. It's just a few people who've had that revelation from the Spirit or a gift from God that's put that passion within them. And I think our role as pastors is to build the culture. And if we build the culture, the initiation will then come from the members. Uh, Tony's story, a uh, recent story on this, is of a lady uh, in his church, actually his PA, and someone in the community called and said, uh, we're wondering if we could use your church facility for a, a solo mother's um, group, just as a support group for them. And, and so she said, well, I'm sure you could, but I, I don't really want that. I'd like to run that group. And this person from a community agency was delighted with that. And so she went and she rallied people from the church and she found people who could volunteer. She found a time in the um, weekly program of the church that it was available for that. And only then did she connect with Tony, the pastor, and, uh, and tell him about what was happening. <laughs> you know, so, so he sort of joked she didn't even ask permission. But that's the whole point. Uh, when people get the heart for the gospel, it's no longer limited to the, the capacity and the creativity and the genius of the pastor with all of our brilliant programs because we're the bomb. Um, the bomb in a positive way there. Not the, um, you know. um, it, it's, it, it suddenly becomes the creativity of the heart, the inspiration, the revelation of God through all of our members and the multiple spheres of influence that they have. And so I believe that the pizza bases the goal. Let's not give too much uh, emphasis to the toppings. Let's just maintain what we've got. Let's build the culture, and uh, it, will, it will happen uh, by itself. 
So um, culture is the key thing. One last thing before I show you what I'm about to show you is the content. Uh, we've also been through the last number of years a, a, a significant change in, uh, in culture. Now, I would say that the change really took place about 30 or 40 years ago, and we've all been playing catch-up. I think the change had taken place before we were really witnessing as, as teenagers, which goes back 25, 30 years. Uh, in terms of New Zealand becoming multi-religious and rejecting this idea of religious truth, and for a simple way of looking at it, um, postmodernism uh, is postmodern. It's after the modern era. The modern era is when our society believed in answers, but everyone gave us promises and lied to us. Politicians gave us uh, all the answers, and we trusted them, but then there was Watergate. Preachers gave us all the answers, but then there was all the cases of sexual infidelity and you know, all the great TV evangelists who fell. Um, scientists said they'd solve all the medical problems and they'd be curing cancer, but then the big pharmaceutical industry came along and we're not sure if the pills save us or kill us. So we began to realise that everyone's promises or truths were really just their truth, and we became sceptical of truth. We rejected the idea of moral absolutes and it made us indifferent toward religion, because we now knew that there was no truth. So post-Christian, really as the baby boomers and some of the generation Xs, we were brought up with a worldview that included Christian morality, which as a result of the 1960s, we didn't want because we wanted to have sex freely, and this Christian morality made us feel guilty. So hence we have 30 years following that of cynicism and criticism towards Christianity in the public square, because people are trying to detach the guilt uh, from the way they're living, and they know they can't change the Bible, and so they become sceptical, cynical uh, instead. But to give you a new cultural term, which is nothing new, we've now moved on from post-Christian. We're something else. It's a technical term. It's called not-Christian, right? And, 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 and there is a reflection here. It's been pointed out to me a few times in the last few years, and it's taken me a while to actually get it myself. But we're actually not-Christian. Uh, we've now got young people growing up who know absolutely nothing uh, about yeah, Christ. Mm -hmm. So how do you tell the truth to someone who doesn't believe truth exists? Mm -hmm. You can't. It's philosophically impossible. This is the change. But what can you do? You can talk with them about it. We've gone from a truth-giving, confrontational approach to evangelism, which I know still works often with Pacific Islanders and would work with the Hindu community and others, um, but we've moved across to a very conversational approach. I believe that Jesus' methodology is demonstrated. He had a conversational approach with an ear open to the Spirit. Uh, and in view of another speaker at conference, Louis Bonifacio, being unable to be here, we'll be looking at this topic uh, tonight uh, as a whole. So just to note that everything I'm about to show you is kind of like the pipes. We want water in our houses. Running an evangelism seminar is like beginning to bring buckets of water up and throwing it in the house. It doesn't meet our needs. We need structure. This is the pipes from the road that bring the water into the house. But what's most important, the pipes or the water? It's the water, isn't it? And so the water is the word of God, it's the truth of God, it's the power of the Spirit. But the, the, the water is also cultural application of that. And I would say that in evangelism today, our teaching must be decidedly conversational. And if it is not, uh, it simply won't work. Because all people will see coming is that confrontational type where you've got the big hero who's the master of evangelism that everybody else is supposed to be like. They've got their amazing stories that nobody else can match and they go out and talk to strangers on the street. And everyone says, good for you, not for me, and that's where we are already, so that's really not going to change anything. If we can simply assume that and, and jump on, here's six principles uh, at a church level for leadership. Uh, to motivate, equip, reinforce, remind, model, and do so consistently. Somehow, we need to motivate our members to, to, to reach out. We need to equip them to engage the gospel with their culture, conversationally, in their everyday life. We are not talking here about getting people on the streets. It's not even a part of the conversation at all this morning. We're talking about every member equipped to engage everyday conversation. Um, we need to reinforce what's taught because they'll forget it and remind them because they'll forget it. And we need to model it so they know what it looks and smells like and somehow to do this with consistency. So here are your six principles uh, sitting up here. Motivate, equip, reinforce, remind, model, and finally with consistency. How are we going to achieve this in our annual calendar? Let's look at some habits that we could embrace for the rest of all time, uh, which might help us to achieve that. Aiming here to demonstrate a, a very simple application, but also to give what I would propose to you is the minimum pace of application. If you pursue this at any lesser pace, 
It is my experience in watching pastors um, apply this that uh, it won't work. You won't build culture. What you do here will simply uh, end up being a program again. Um, and for a photo, there'll be a full, uh, I'll tell you when there's a, a full diagram if you want a photo. Um, okay, consistency, these are annual habits. Uh, to motivate, how about at the beginning of every school term? It's a simple way to hook a habit. All the kids have come back from holidays and the parents are with them. This is time to say, okay folks, in the next 10 to 12 weeks, as a reminder, the mission of the church is making disciples out of people who aren't yet disciples. It necessarily involves evangelism and discipleship. Within our church program, here's the opportunities. Within combined church program, here's the opportunities. In your small groups, here's your opportunities. And in your personal life, here's the things that you could do. A simple motivation that helps them to see opportunities to keep them moving. Secondly, we need to equip our members through the pulpit every year. And how about at the beginning of the year, a four-week sermon series about the mission of the church? Um, however, people remember 10% of what they hear, 40% of what they say, and 70% of what they do. So if we want this to go into long-term memory, how about we create a new tradition in our churches that whenever I preach on the mission of the church, which I'm going to do seven times per year, um, I am now asking that all of our small group leaders would do a very specific discussion that I'm going to give to you. Uh, and on the other weeks you have some freedom in terms of what you look at, but I'd ask you to work with me on this because we have a mission given to us by Jesus, and I'm just not convinced we're doing as well at this as we could. Would that be all right? And so um, to help you with this, we're working at, at collecting and creating um, sermon series, so sermon outlines with matching studies. They're online. I'll show you where they are shortly. Uh, um, yeah. The next thing that's needed, though, is that the small group can reinforce, making you four to seven times more effective as an equipper, but uh, people are going to forget really quickly. So people need to see a model, they need to be encouraged, but they also need reminding. How about the idea of a testimony every single month? Religiously create a habit. On the first week of every month, we will have a testimony of someone trying to, not someone who shared the gospel, that's too high a standard. Um, to be realistic for most churches. The standard is someone who attempted to engage a spiritual conversation in their everyday life. We are not wanting on stage, week after week, people to go out to share the gospel on the street. We will bury ourselves uh, in, in our goals. We are wanting the average Joe who just talked over the fence to the neighbour and dared to do what we've been encouraging. They dared to ask a question. Out of interest, are you religious at all? And then ended up in an amazing conversation hearing how they have their floating grandmother, you know, floating around the house and whatever else it is that they, they might believe and then ended up engaging in that conversation. And where people have had bad experiences, uh, that's actually great as well. You know, um, so you, you, you introduce religion into a conversation and they say, oh, no, no, I'm really, really not interested in religion. And the person feels shut down. But what are you going to do? The fact is, actually, that's a great learning opportunity. First of all, the person succeeded. They tried uh, but secondly, a great question to ask might be, why is that? And I've had a few examples of this now, and uh, never have I had someone say a comment like that to me, and we didn't end up in a spiritual conversation as yet. Mm. Uh, uh, often they brought it back where I had to, was speaking with them for an hour, like stuck on a plane. Um, I found in my experience that if I, because I was trying to get testimonies randomly from a congregation, that if I asked for testimonies every three weeks, I could always find a testimony. If I asked for testimonies every four weeks, I struggled to find a testimony. And what I worked out was there was a natural momentum to the positive encouragement that the testimony gave. And it would motivate people to apply certain things for a certain time, and then that effect would wear off. And I found it to be such a pattern that I embraced a habit of having a testimony every three weeks. Um, and I would, of course, look for them in my own conversations to be prepared before a service as well. The point, though, is that you've suddenly got a positive vibe, if we may hark back to the castle, um, the movie from Australia. And what you want to do is use the vibe um, of this testimony that someone's just told uh, as a springboard to remind. So they talk about a conversation. And you go, Sally, that was just, what an amazing story, eh? Um, do you remember, I was preaching back at the start of the year about three questions that could, could turn a conversation. See, great conversations, they're no further away than great questions. Can anyone remember what those three questions were? And out of interest, because I talk about this all the time, can anyone remember the three questions I'm referring to? Just out of interest. 
This lets me know I've seven years of my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, can anyone? Well, yeah. 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 Right. I do this talk. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you mean by that? Where did you get that from? Yep. And have you Okay, so uh, come on, we all know that all religions are the same. Question one? And what do you mean by that? Oh, you know, all the religions just say the same thing, don't they? Where did you get that from? Oh, I, I just, um, oh, isn't, isn't that the case? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Here's the challenging part, because you've got to have something to say as a question. Now, have you considered that um, what you, what you believe, there could be some other truths out there as well. Yeah, and they can say, yes, there's many truths, but it's, it's, it's good. Um, what was the line, uh, Luke, because you've done this one as well? Um, all the religions are the same, aren't they? Um, were you aware that... Have you considered that? Sorry. Uh, oh, oh, you're not... Have you considered that uh, religions say uh, mutually exclusive things? They seem to say the opposite. Yeah. So have you That's considered it. how they can all be true when they're saying completely different? Yeah, so, so there, there would be an example. For example, some say there is a God, some say there isn't. Salvation is by doing good works. Salvation is a gift from God by grace, for example. Uh, God is good. Very small number of religions. God is unknowable and all the morality is the same. You know, so the moral view is different. Uh, and by wording it as a question, Stu still hasn't made a statement. And so anyway, that's uh, sidetracking. But you can, you can remind of things like that. Um, and, and hopefully it helps people remember. Uh, finally, we need to preach the gospel. And we found from feedback that uh, very few pastors were preaching simple, clear gospel messages, uh, reinforced with testimonies, with a uh, response invitation. And I put to you that a good preaching of the gospel in a church environment needs to be reinforced by a testimony, because it's got to be shown to be applicable to life. It's not just theology, and it needs an invitation or a response opportunity. That is what the gospel is about. It's inviting people to respond to what God has done through Christ. And I put to you as a simple thing in this diagram that if you apply this at any lesser pace, I'm yet to be convinced that you can turn the culture. Um, if you skip the testimonies, it simply won't work. What you've taught in, uh, in February will be completely forgotten by the end of March already, right? Uh, and it, it'll be fully forgotten by October, November. You're just running an annual program. Yeah? But if you put these things together, it's possible, using the, the testimonies as springboards, to remind of key things that you're teaching and to get it into long-term memory. And what I found is that it, it breeds culture. And, and the, the, the day where I really worked out that this was working was when I turned up to small group leader meetings in those in-between seasons where you weren't really focusing on outreach. Because we'd focus on outreach at Christmas and Easter, but also in about August. And there was a few testimonies from the leaders of people that they'd uh, seen come to faith in their small group over that last month. And I turned up the next month and we'd done nothing related to the mission of the church. We were in a, a discipleship-focused period of the calendar. And there were testimonies again of people who'd come to faith in the small groups. And you got to month three of that happening, and that's when I went to see um, the newly appointed senior pastor to ask for more staff. Because we, we simply were on a, a growth trajectory uh, where I knew I already wasn't coping with um, you know, 35 turning to 300, for example, in one division of what I was doing. Um, so so th this stuff uh, really can work, but culture takes three to five years to change. Um, there are different ways you can approach it, but I put to you that this is reasonably simple. Uh, as pastors, we do most of these things already in terms of preach, we have small groups. This isn't difficult to apply, and if we can put those things on a calendar, it is a program for year one, because it's not a habit yet. It might partly be a program for year two, um, but as it becomes the habit, we'll get a feel for the ebb and flow of the the gospel temperature at any point in time, and we'll learn how to actually keep that alive. Now, what we need to do next, oh, so here's some resources online. Um, altogether.co.nz is our website. Uh, if you click on AT Consulting, Altogether Consulting, that's where we provide resources for pastors. It looks like this, there's an introductory video from Tony and myself, and if you scroll down, we've got four leadership workshops. So these are videos I created at the end of last year to put content like that which I've just shared onto videos that are the shortest is 9 minutes and the longest is 16, that a church leadership team could simply sit down and watch and then discuss um, with the discussion guide underneath um, uh, about that video. The first video is to ensure we're on the same page because uh, even pastors groups when I first visited them six years ago around New Zealand had considerable disagreement within them on what the mission of the church was. 
And so that was a topic that we actually addressed around the country. And I'm not finding that same um, resistance now uh, that there was on a first trip around the country. The second video is uh, what I've just shared with you. With that diagram, you'll recognise it. Um, the third video is about small group stuff, which I'm about to share. And the fourth one is about the conversational DNA from a leadership perspective, which I would make the first video to show a leadership team, by the way. Um, and if you go back up to there, um, there's small group and uh, <coughs> sermon outlines. If you click on that, there's a range of resources. Click on any of those, you'll get a Word document that you can save and make your own. A sermon outline on a page, page and a half. A small group study underneath. Now, the next thing is that we need to, to turn culture. We have to now engage our small group leaders because if it's just us as the pastor doing this, there's no accountability in a large group. In fact, I don't even know if you're listening to me. That's the truth. Um, I could even tell a joke and you laugh, and it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that you're listening to me. Um, because uh, we naturally, as human beings, respond to our environment. Uh, you know, raise your hands, everybody. Let's, you know, praise the Lord. Good Pentecostals, man. We can be all the way here while we're still thinking about what we're going to have for lunch. And we're completely oblivious. So, so there's no accountability in a large group. This has to go to the small group. And, and I am yet to be convinced that it's possible to turn a church without the small group dynamic being made catchless, the home base for evangelism. That's no small statement. And uh, in, in the book I wrote called uh, The Elephant in the Room, the, I talked about missing links in our evangelistic approaches and thinking in New Zealand, which might explain why we're not seeing results. But one chapter I call The Missing Wall. It's not just a missing link, and that is small group philosophy. Uh, it is my opinion that our understanding of the small group dynamic of the local church is, is grossly deficient. And in fact, that within our church culture, we've actually lost a whole body of knowledge that I think is essential uh, to the church being able to function as the church. Um, we can mobilise people for evangelism, a simple illustration, is an individually to engage their culture uh, through everyday conversation, as small groups at a congregational level and at a combined level. To go through them, a pastor who wants to mobilise their congregation begins at the congregational level. They preach, they motivate, they teach. But the goal, I believe, needs to be number one. Uh, as I said earlier, 100 mobilised members can accomplish far more than a talented pastor. And so uh, the, the goal at, at Piston 3 is to mobilise number one. However, number one, there's no accountability, and that's why I think number two is the home base. Uh, to note Piston number four, I'm talking on um, Saturday morning about that, uh, we'll leave it. Except to note that I put to you that statistically six out of ten probably do not have a church-going friend, and statistically eight out of ten in New Zealand have no person trying to represent Christ to them. And so piston number four is what we're coming to later this morning. So for a very quick thing on small group and what we could do, um, here's some habits for small groups, and this is communicated similar principles differently in that online video. First of all, every year we've got to start with the goal. Every small group needs to talk about their mission as a full session from the Word of God at the start of every year. Everyone needs to list some people they'd like to encourage toward faith. If we don't have a target, we've got nothing to aim at. People are not targets, but if we don't give them something to aim at, most people are simply going to do nothing, right? We, we, we know this from leadership. Then we could list next to their names things that might hinder them. Uh, for example, they're an atheist and uh, they play golf on Sunday, so they can't come to church anyway. Uh, and then their interests, because these are going to be connection points. Well, the hindrances can be for prayer um, as well as for conversation, because once we've mastered the conversational sort of approach, you can talk about absolutely anything without us having to be awkward. Secondly, quarterly motivation and your equipping in the small group. Exactly the same as the red boxes that you saw in the previous diagram. So the pastor does a four-week equipping series. Let's imagine it's February starting the year. The small group does the studies. Um, the pastor's motivating at the beginning of every school term. The small group leader, either in a whole study if requested, or through 10 minutes, does exactly the same. Thirdly, there needs to be intentional revision. And, and habit-wise, um, I would link this actually, if you just make this point number two, testimonies. Habit-wise, I'd link that again to testimony. How about on the second and fourth week of every month, the small group leader or someone in the small group says, hey, did anyone try to engage a conversation about faith with someone this week? I'd encourage us all to almost remove the word evangelism uh, from our, our vocabularies, just by the way, it's just got too many negative conversations. Um, I think that can be changed, but uh, we're a long way from it, yes, uh, I think nationally. 
Um, and, and if you've got two little testimonies coming out, even the bad experiences you can analyze, you're learning together how to engage. Someone says, I think all religions are the same, but the Christian was stuck for words. You can start talking as a small group about what you could have said. You do that on an ongoing basis. There is no question uh, that the skill and perspective level of the members will grow. The fourth habit would be consistent prayer. How about the first week of every month, you pray for the people that you listen at the start of the year. Very simple habit, it keeps the vision before your eyes. In terms of revision, how about, um, well, I didn't, should have mentioned it just before, exactly like the pastor is doing, the small group leader gets taught to use positive testimonies as springboards for reminding. And then finally, intentionally connect through the shared points of interest. Um, which is to say, Nick's got a boat, and uh, Steve's got friends who love to go fishing, and uh, I've got the gift of the gab. So let's, you know, take um, uh, Steve's friends on Nick's boat and bring me. All right? The only problem being that for Whangapano at Greymouth and Tauranga to get together would be a stupidly expensive fishing trip. But, um, but if we were a church small group, the point is that, that this is actually a license to have fun. And how much of the small group agenda is interrupted? Because you would appreciate, as I did, trying to lead adult small groups, which was completely different to the youth young adult sector. Um, you know, I've been leading this group for 15 years. You know, no one's coming in to tell me anything. And uh, pastor, you get to lead the congregation. That's your arena for leadership. But, but this small group is my arena for leadership. This is where I get to express my leadership gifts and my teaching gifts. Don't interrupt my agenda. So I don't know if you relate to that, but... Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, and, and there's some truth to it too. We need to release the gifts of our members as small group leaders, but there also needs to be, um, you know, we need to be working together for the mission. Um, if you do a session on the mission at the start of the year, that interrupts one week of the content of the study. If you do a quarterly equipping, uh, sorry, a um, four week equipping, uh, there, that's four weeks. If you did do the motivation, that could be uh, as whole studies, that could be seven weeks. But revision, prayer, testimony, that's five or ten minutes. And connecting at shared points of interest, two, four, six, eight times, is probably fishing on Saturday, not on Wednesday night when we have small group. My point is that you're interrupting no more than um, five to eight of the studies in an entire year in a small group. Worst case scenario, 52 weeks of the year, they still have 44 weeks of the year to decide what they would like the study content to be. You haven't hijacked their small group. You see, what I've given you is the answer to this specific question. How could we reinsert the mission of the church and the mission of the church small group to the church small group without interrupting uh, what's already happening? And this is how you can do it. It's about habits that we embrace within our leadership. The key word here is intentionality. Intentionality can apply these habits um, and... Is it time for questions or not yet? Absolutely. So have I got for three minutes and cool. then we'll bounce into the conversation. That, yeah. yeah. Cool. So so what it achieves is that the pastor is kind of the pastor has disabilities. A pastor's elbows are attached to the side. I can motivate you as much as I like, but I'm just not released because I can't make you do anything and I don't even know what you're thinking or doing. Uh, we all love the lost, don't we? Amen. We're all gonna go out and do something. Amen, you know. Um, but in the small group that effect can be released and amplified. It's the only way to turn a church. And without the small group leaders being on board with this, um, I just simply put to you that you will not turn your church. You will not build a sustainable culture of outreach. It will be dependent upon your high energy as a motivational pastor, just going at them the whole time to keep them moving. Some pastors are gifted at that. Some churches kind of achieve it. Most pastors are not the highly gifted, motivational evangelist who can actually do that. So for most of us, we actually need to learn these leadership things. And I put to you again, I have had 14-year-olds understand and apply this. This is not difficult. And I also give you my observations since showing the first pastors in New Zealand this stuff about five, six, or six years ago. Um, most apply it their own way. And if I can just give you the reflection, you apply it without the testimony, it, it just won't work. You apply it without the small group, it, it just won't work. You apply it without preaching the gospel yourself and trying to engage conversation yourself so you've got stories, it just won't work. Um, in other words, to break it down to its simplest level from a, a logical leadership point of view, I just humbly submit to you that this, that diagram I originally gave you is the very minimum that will work to turn culture. 
anything shy of that pace, and uh, I believe that the, the momentum uh, won't grow in it. So thinking leads to behaviour, behaviour leads to results. Very last comment. Um, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is a change of thinking up here. And before you can put something new into this cup, what do you first have to do? You've got to empty what's inside of it. You already have an outreach culture. You already have a leadership, outreach, mobilisation culture. You already have a fully developed philosophy on what you think you are responsible to do as a pastor to change the culture of your church and to mobilise it. Um, my simple question is, is it working? If it's not, be aware this isn't just new habits to embrace. You might have to actually empty yourself of some of the things you've learned from being in church for so long to actually embrace and learn something new. And, uh, and then uh, you might be able to see change. So uh, uh, we'll finish it, um, we'll leave it there, and uh, that leaves us 15 minutes for discussion.